Michael Dare and Songs. Play. In the name of God, who is love. Amen. It wasn't about the 5,000 people gathered. It was about the miracle of love shared when Jesus blessed the food and the gathering in that green hill that mattered most. 5,000 people followed Jesus wherever he went. Well, they have seen him heal the sick and made miracles. Men, women, young and old followed Jesus. For they were hungry to hear his inspiring words <coughs> and get in touch. Now imagine yourself to be in that hill with Jesus. You tried to press against his mother just to get closer to him and be able to hear his words. No microphones or megaphones. And Jesus wouldn't speak about his breath, but rather calm and soft, and thus requiring everyone to be quiet and observe less movements. There may be people who are hard of hearing, blind, lame, and the like, but they don't mind as long as they could touch Jesus' garments and they will be healed. Some of them came from hundreds of miles, bringing with them just enough water and food to eat on the road. This may be their third day following Jesus before the Feast of the Passover, and they run out of food. And Jesus saw their needs and asked Philip where they could buy some bread so the people could eat. Now you may ask, why is Philip, who was among the least known of the disciples? Philip, and Jesus knew that Philip was from the place and he should know where the nearest bakery was. But it was already late in the afternoon. And that the nearest bakery may not have enough bread for 5,000 people. But Andrew, Andrew, Philip's brother, was good in introducing people to Christ. He said, there is a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish. And Jesus took them. I can, I can just imagine that Jesus tapping his shoulder of his little boy and hugging him. Jesus gave thanks and distributed them to all, and they all ate. Lo and behold, twelve baskets came extra. Now, how are we to interpret this miracle? How are we to understand? The feeding of the multitude, knowing that there were only five bagels and two sardines. There are three possibilities suggested to us by biblical scholars. One is to take the record as it is. And this is the literal interpretation. Jesus, after saying a prayer of thanks, multiplied the food so that all the people were able to eat not only bread and fish, but perhaps also yam, eggs, pastries. After all, did not Jesus miraculously produce wine at a wedding feast in Cana, Galilee? Did he not cause the lame to walk and the blind to see and the dead to come to life again? Why should he not multiply the boy's meal to enable 5,000 men and women, old and young, to have supper to their heart's content? This is the argument of those who take the literal approach to this miracle. The second possibility is for us to look at this miracle as a symbol of the messianic banquet in the kingdom of God. In other words, it was a symbolic supper rather than an actual meal. The people were given a small amount of fish and bread which they ate in celebration and in anticipation of a great messianic banquet in the kingdom of God. And they were satisfied, not in the spiritual sense, 
Now, I mean physical sense, but in his spiritual sense. Because Jesus himself was in their midst as their host. In short, it was a foretaste of the Lord's Supper which Jesus instituted just before his crucifixion. Some Bible scholars believe that this was the purpose of John, in which gospel account Jesus is pictured as the bread of life. You may know that John is a gospel of science. It turned everything to something, to something else. It's very small. The twelve baskets may represent the twelve tribes of Israel, and they were all gathered together. This theory cannot be easily dismissed, especially when we remember that in both the Old and New Testaments, life in the kingdom of God is very much associated with deliverance from hunger and poverty. In the third possibility, the people may have brought their lunch boxes, but they would not open it for fear that the others did not bring any provisions and therefore might ask for food from them. And if they gave anything, there might not be enough left for them. Just like when you throw a bread to a pigeon and all the rest learn about that, there's more pigeon. However, when the disciples and a boy brought that they, what they had to Jesus and be shared with the people after saying grace, the people themselves were challenged to bring out their own food and share it with one another. In other words, the true miracle here was not the multiplication of food, but the change of hearts from morbid selfishness to loving generosity. Bible scholars tell us that it was the customary among the Jews to bring food with them wherever they went. The people who followed Jesus were not dumb to embark on a long mile journey without any provision. For all we know, many of them brought more than what they needed because they were not sure to have an audience with Jesus right away. And when they saw the disciples bringing out their lunch boxes, they too brought out their own and even shared what they had with one another. And to their great surprise, 12 baskets of broken pieces were gathered at their supper. This event reminds me of our recent annual church camping at Lake Orville last week. It was so organized and well planned where each family brought their food, cooked them from Thursday to Sunday, where everyone had their fill, and even extra food to take on their way back home. There were about six people, where 30 are children, youth, and young adults. All shared the miracle of being a family, sharing, being with nature, and all the constellations above. And after all those wonderful experiences we had over the weekend, perhaps one of the most challenging, challenging experiences I had was to accompany a friend to line up with other people who are seeking bed and shelter at St. Vincent de Paul in San Francisco. It was 6 o'clock in the evening when we got in line. And the process in securing a bed at this shelter home is to be in line by 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Where 100 people will be escorted to sit on chairs inside a waiting area, while others wait outside the street, rain or shine. It was already 8 o'clock in the evening, and we have not been in call. In my conversation with those who were in line, they said they've been there for six hours, is tending, and if tired, they sit on the pavement. And I was told of a 75 years old woman who had waited for six hours before she got a bed. Those who did not get bed will have to sleep in 
chair provided for them. Or they will have to speak at St. Boniface Church Jews in San Francisco. Some of those lining up were only there for a shower. On the following day, at 7 o'clock in the morning, my friend and I went to Glide Memorial Methodist Church at Ellis Street, as we were told the day before, to line up and get a number which is to be used as a pass for another lineup at 3 o'clock in the afternoon the same day. You will then wait for them to call your number and inform you that you got a bed to a designated shelter home in the area. Now, this process is to be done every day. Get in line, 7 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. You are not secure of the bed. I was informed by my friend about this experience, as well as the others, how the staff treat them as less than a human. Where power is struggle and favoritism is very rampant. If the staff don't like you, they will give you your bed to others, and you will be told to wait the next day. Old woman, how many of them will have to line up just to get a bed for six hours or more and not sure if they will have a bed in the night? The disciples of Jesus suggested to him, send them away. Let them go to the village and country right about to lodge and get provisions. Send them away. But Jesus said, You give them something to he who knew the importance of privacy and who took time to be alone with God also knew how to convert an emergency into a rare missionary opportunity. We at Holy Child in St. Martin, in partnership with other donors, supporters, and volunteers, work hand in hand in providing free health education, vital science assessment, and feeding the homeless and at the shelter is a way of walking what Christ told us to do, to tend his sheep and give them something to eat. The problem of hunger in the world is not just simple economic problem. It is also a spiritual and that therefore the answer must also touch the spirit of humankind. Those who are serving the poor should have compassion and mercy in their hearts and in their lives and treat them as the same. It is not enough that we take advantage of the fruit of Silicon Valley, but we must also subject ourselves to a kind of spiritual surgery so that our greedy and stony hearts may somehow know the joy and the virtue of sharing. While we certainly must take time to rest and be alone with ourselves and with our families. There are times when such privacy has to be sacrificed for the sake of a greater need. Our failure to sense such need can spell disaster in human relationships. How many opportunities for Christ have we lost because our privacy cannot be invaded? One mark of Christian maturity is to be able to know when we can be disturbed and to welcome such disturbance as an opportunity to be of help. If we are to be God's agents in feeding the nameless multitudes around us, if we are to be part of God's answer to the crying need of people, we must learn to bring what we have to Christ for His blessing and consecration. This is what the disciples did when the bread and the fish was blessed by Christ. They became the source of great abundance. Let us therefore be grateful for the divine assurance that in order to achieve self-fulfillment, that in order that we get all help and meet the needs of our fellow human beings, it is not necessary that we amass great wealth. What is necessary 
is that we consecrate our possessions and our life to Christ and He will make us the channels of His grace. That is the miracle that we must yearn to possess for ourselves, for the members of our families and for our world. Now, as we take the consecrated bread and wine in the Eucharist, may we always be reminded of the compassion and kindness of Christ in the world and be a part of the movement, part of beginning to spread the love of Christ, of God in Jesus Christ by caring and sharing your blessings to all who are in need. For there is nothing else that is that are that we are here for in this world to live, but to love and be loved. So I charge you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, as you go out into this blessed holy place, and you go out 